But first, BBC Radio. Director Helen Bowden yesterday brought the news to staff that another £22 million needed to be saved in order for BBC Radio to meet its commitments to save money following the 2010 licence fee settlement that required the BBC overall to save 16% of its budget by the end of 2016. Another 65 jobs are to go, that is on top of the 149 gone already, and the stations are to be reorganised into two hubs, one for radios 1 and 2 and another for radios 3 and 4, so as to combine some back-office functions and thereby, it is said, reduce costs. Bowden said the situation was serious, but she hoped the impact on output and audiences would be minimal. It'll be smaller, it'll be simpler, but I'm also completely confident it will still be brilliant delivering outstanding content, pushing the boundaries of innovation and giving the world and the nation world-class events. But is that how things will actually work out? We did ask the BBC to join us, but they um, didn't. Never mind, because we are joined by Telegraph critic and long-time radio watcher Gillian Reynolds and Paul Robinson, one-time managing editor of Radio 1, head of strategy for BBC Radio and a senior executive in commercial radio now... He's Chief Executive of the Radio Academy. But first I'm joined by former Radio 4 controller and now Master of St Peter's College, Oxford, Mark Damazer. Mark, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Um, your reaction to these cuts, you've been subjected when you were controller of Radio 4 to several rounds of efficiencies and I think at one point ventured to suggest that it had gone as far as it possibly could. Well, here they are going further. What do you reckon? Well, nobody's going to applaud, um, and I dare say it comes with the territory that you sometimes think that you can't imagine where the next cut will come from that won't affect output. Uh, I don't honestly know. This is an art and not a science. I mean, it reminds me a little bit of the prerogative of the chiefs of the armed forces have to go to see the prime minister to say, prime minister, these cuts are so bad in defence that if there were to be a war, we couldn't fight it. Uh, there comes a point where the bluff is called and you end up not being able to fight the war. I don't know yet that we're at that point. Uh, it's a question of skill and dexterity amongst the people who control the budgets, and there's no reason to assume that Gwyn Williams at Radio 4, for instance, doesn't know in her back pocket what the plan is that will enable her to sort it out. So uh, I'm not prepared to say it's the end of the world. Um, I think that given the licence fee settlement in 2010 is what it was, and you can't ever see that being hugely restored, it's not surprising that radio has to take something more of a hit, so, regrettable though that is. So when you said previously that you were already, you'd cut through the fat and you were into the muscle, were you crying wolf? No, um, but I think if I were to look back on it, what I meant was that there was very little scope left for making changes within programmes or in programme teams that wouldn't lead to the loss of whole strands of output. And I always regarded that as something that I was going to try and do only as a last resort. So which, I must think be that, which must be where we are now. Well, I mean, I did a bit of that, but I managed, because my budget cuts were perhaps not as bad as Gwyn and others are going to face now, but, I mean, I did do some things which were unpopular, uh, but I don't think they hugely weaken the station. So, for instance, to get very concrete about it, um, I lost the Friday drama origination slot at 9 o'clock on Friday night. Uh, why? Because it's extremely expensive, and if you looked at the audience figures, uh, it seemed to me that it was doable and there was plenty of drama left that was going to be originated. Um, in fact, I walked into a bit of a maelstrom and then got out of it after two or three weeks. And there are similar decisions that Gwyn will have to make, uh, and they may not be quite, how can I put it, as easy. And I don't mean that the Friday drama thing was without pain, but they may not be quite okay. as easy or as welcome as that one. All right. Gillian Reynolds, uh, what's your reaction to the hubs idea? Is that going to work? Well, I've no idea what hubs are. I mean, it's obviously a kind of management reshuffle of resources, and that's fine, you know. I, th I think the idea is you put them together in one I place. I understand and, the you know, thing, you know. Theory. I understand the principle. Um, uh, how it will work, heaven only knows, because bringing together things like presentation in Radio 3 and 4, probably it's, it's got a bit of sense about it. Putting together certain things, yes. As Mark says, you've got to do... You can only juggle the money so far... The point, the fundamental point I would like to make is think cake. Think a big cake, 
The big cake is television. Television can take a lot more slices out of it than radio. Radio is a small cake, and the slices get smaller, and pretty soon we'll be down to the crumbs on the plate. So do you think radio is being affected disproportionately by the whole I, BBC effort to save 16%? I really do, because if you look at the proportion of BBC hours in total consumed by the public, just about half, just under half, go to radio. Ra BBC radio reaches 66%. Percent of the population. I mean, television doesn't touch it, and radio has more networks, more creativity, more programme ideas, fewer even at this moment of repeats. I mean, it, it just it, in one of the things that the, the BBC that Helen said, Helen Bowden said in her speech, was that amongst other things, there would be, and I'll quote you, it was a reduction in commissioning volumes. Um, have you noticed what that might mean? I have a horrible suspicion it means doing fewer but bigger because the BBC is clearly caught in a terrible dilemma here. They've got the commitment to make these massive cuts through the disastrous licence fee settlement. At the same time they're feeling drops in audience of under 45s, quite catastrophic serious drops. So the push to online is becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. So the push to do things right across the BBC like for instance Glastonbury everywhere, all of a sudden all the time, huge investment huge impact, I don't think so. Well, they might say that that has more, more impact and it delivers better value than, yeah, but one than, after than, another. than another documentary on Radio 4. Well, it, you know, it depends whether you love your audience, whether you nurture them, whether you're, whether you're in the business of public service. Paul Robinson, uh, you've worked in the independent sector, uh, where, of course, things are completely different. <laughs> the, the financial scales are almost upside down. Um, can, can the BBC, do you think... Uh, achieve these cuts without impacting on listeners? Well, these cuts are very significant. 15% of your staff going is a large number, and these are big numbers in terms of the total radio budget. So I think it'd be amazing if the BBC could do this without affecting on air. I think what's quite interesting is that a number of changes have been made, uh, I guess, using DQF as a, a rationale. You know, that, that I should say, for instance, is that's delivering quality first, which is the BBC's first. plan to save the money. Yes, um, whatever you may, may think about those <laughs> wonderful... That wonderful mnemonic. Uh, refreshments taken place at Radio 1 and Radio 2, for example, which seems to coincide with the, these uh, savings. You know, that may or may not be fortuitous. But I'd be amazed if they can do this without making uh, quite impactful changes on air. I just don't think it's possible to make savings of this sort of size. Can, can they do it with changes that audiences will not react against? I mean, Radio 4, um, here we are on Radio 4, Radio 4 listeners certainly in days not too long gone by would would march on uh, Langham Place at the thought of the shipping forecast being moved. Well, but... I think what Helen's done is quite clever, and that is she's recognised that the way Radio 1 and Radio 2 and 6 Music make programmes is m similar, and Radio 3 and Radio 4 is more similar, because the latter are about commissioners and commission programming, a lot of which is not live, and then Radio 1 and Radio 2 and the other music networks are largely live shows with a presenter. So what they're saying is by putting those two together as hubs, you can actually save back office functions, and that seems to me to be sensible... Because recognising Helen how is, shows are made. Helen is a programme maker, she is a radio person, yes. and she understands the importance of the programmes. Exactly. I mean, uh, so, so, I mean, so I, Mark, can yes. I interject? I mean, one point to make is that radio audiences have held up astonishingly well through the series of cuts that have had to be delivered so far. And that's not only a question of audience numbers, it's also a question of audience esteem. So, as it were, the gloom sayers have thus far been defeated. Now, that does not mean that at some point you can continue to rely on that in the uh, infinite future against this scale of cuts. Well, we just don't know. Is, 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 isn't, isn't it... I mean, on one version of events has it that, you know, you reach a point where the roof falls in and everything sort of suddenly changes and everybody goes, well, good Lord, that's, that's an outrage. Isn't the more likely consequence that you gradually steer off, in other words that in five years' time you get to the point where you think, oh, hang on a minute, we're not doing that anymore. So that seems to me to be the biggest problem, which is about... Um, I mean, the jargon word is aspiration, but let me translate that. What is the danger here is self-impoverishment and a lack of self-esteem amongst all the people who make these great programmes that they no longer feel that they can try something which is a bit more expensive than the norm. So here's a point. Um, the Neil McGregor series, five, six years back was more expensive at the point at which we were commissioning it. It wasn't vastly more expensive, it was more expensive. It was the easiest commissioning decision one could ever make. Was it worth spending 15 or 
above the average price for that slot in order to have Neil McGregor do a history of the world in 100 objects. So you felt able to be adventurous. And there was plenty of money in the system to be able to do that, even at that point when we were cutting. Now, no commissioner in their right mind would be in a position to want to turn that down. The question is whether the producers are in a culture where they feel that they are entitled to put forward ideas which are out of the norm, run a degree of experiment that has a financial cost to it and can still put them forward thinking there's enough money in the kitchen to do it. Does that sound reasonable to you? It does sound reasonable. There is a big Neil McGregor season coming about Germany in the autumn. That's fine, that's in the can. But between now and April, these jobs will go. The steady push to online I see as a danger. This this is why I'm not being old-fashioned here. I'm just saying, you know, the faster you push people into online iPlayer all the other devices that the BBC is busily inventing, the easier you make it to move okay. to subscription eventually. But Paul, one other question. Is there, are there a sort of, again, you've been outside, you've seen the way these things work, and briefly if you can, is there, are there sort of bullets that remain to be bitten? Are there big bits of the way that this place works that they could tackle that would make a significant impact that audiences might genuinely not notice? Well, certainly, if you looked at how the BBC runs its music networks and compared to the commercial sector, there would be a lot of things you could do in terms of how you staff it up, particularly in terms of the size of editorial teams. But I think Gillian alluded to at the beginning, I think part of the problem with this is the cuts are by uh, division, and really that doesn't work. What should be happening is the BBC should be looking at these cuts in totality. And um, clearly there's cuts in radio, there's cuts in news. You know, even radio is not being looked at together because BBC Local Radio and Radio 5 Live and a different pot of cuts. So I think the problem is it's by division and therefore you are salami slicing and risking really doing damage. OK, Paul Robinson, uh, Julian Reynolds, many thanks, and Mark, thank, Mark Dammer, I should say, uh, many thanks indeed. Uh, we've had a couple of tweets and emails. Trevor Mitchell says, when BBC bosses say no effects, I worry. When they say, we hope there won't be, I begin to panic. Bob Hawkins says, there are so many silent characters on The Archers now, I think the radio cuts may already have started. And Kathleen emails, over the past few years, it has been saddened me to see the World Service and Radio 4 decline. There are more errors. There is more repetition of programmes and new stories and depth is just not there. Anyway, if you've thought about that, Richard Ingram's up next or the Soar Away Suns World Cup giveaway after that. It's hashtag R4 Media Show and by all means, email us via the website.